Okay, let's have a word of prayer and we'll take a look, look at this study. Our Father, we're thankful for the time you give us together as believers. We're thankful for your word. And we ask as we look at these things this afternoon that we might be encouraged, perhaps as we might have our, our own personal particular need. We thank you for it. Amen. Um, so when you think of care, what are different things come to mind when somebody uses the word care? Care for someone what just thinking about thinking about somebody what what comes to mind when you think of the word worry stress stress <laughs> Fear. What? Fear. Fear. Terror. Terror. Okay. <laughs> it takes fear up a notch. <laughs> well, I'm still thinking about someone or something. Seriously, it does. You can't, you can't worry about something if you don't think about it. <laughs> and that is what they both have in common. And the interesting thing is about the word we're going to look at today goes both directions. It is thinking about somebody. It's a concern for somebody in some way. And it is both negative as something that can be a worry, a stressor, or it can be um, a compassionate concern for somebody. And we're going to see both of those. So with that, let's take our Bibles and let's turn to <clears throat> turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. There's a lot of places where this word occurs, but we're just looking at a handful of illustrations on this just to kind of show you the breadth of meaning exactly what we just said but you can see it for yourself here in scriptures second corinthians chapter 11 verse 28 and paul is giving a list of all these things that he goes through all these things and bobbing in the ocean overnight and things like this he comes to verse 28 and he says and besides all these things these outside pressures these pressures these things are standing against me out there Day to day, the care of all the churches. Now, when Paul's going through this list, he, he's listing things that are negative that he's experienced, but they were all things that when he went through them, they weren't things that he could particularly do anything about. Hey, if you're in a shipwreck, what can you do about it? <laughs> the shipwrecks, you can't stop the shipwreck. And when you're journeying on the road, and there are robbers that hold you up. And apparently that must have happened to Paul because he says well, they were in danger of robbers on the road. Um, he must have experienced this at some time. But you get down to verse 28. And I think something else that Paul is indicating, and he doesn't, I don't think he's saying that it's negative. It says it's the care for all the churches. For who, verse 29, who being weak, I'm not weak. And who is scandalized and and I don't burn, you know, somebody causes a problem. So in other words, Paul says, you know, when other people go through stuff, I go through it with them. Now, is that inappropriate? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Maybe I'm getting Josh's cold. This is why he stepped out this afternoon. He texted me earlier today because he said his, his cold is just making it hard for him to talk any length of time. But we're talking about the church. He says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 25, it says, lest there should be a division or a schism or a split within the body, that they should have the same care, that the members should have the same care for one another. Is that a negative thing? No, that's talking about you're thinking about other people and you're thinking about them positively. You're concerned for them. You're concerned for their well-being as you function and serve. So this is a positive example. And I think Paul's statement over there in 2 Corinthians 11 also was a positive example of care, care for these people. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he's talking to uh, people that are unmarried 
And he's just given Sharon a piece of his own personal advice on whether or not they should get married. Um, this is, I always think this is interesting because I'm married and I just can't imagine not being married. And I just can't imagine what my life would be like if I were not married, just because of the way God uses Peg in my life in so many ways. But I have to take in seriously what Paul says here in first Corinthians chapter seven and verse 32, but I desire you to be free from care. That's a form of our word care, but it's just it has a letter on the beginning. It says not, not having that care. It says for the unmarried person cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the married one cares for the things of the world, how he might please his wife. Now, I don't think Paul's saying it's negative to care for those things, but he says you just realize your cares are divided, aren't they? You, you, you have both to care for your wife and you care for the world. You're doing both of those uh, things in there. So I don't think he's saying that that's a negative thing that, oh, it's horrible that you have to care for a spouse, care about the things of the world for a spouse. That's a horrible. He's not saying that. Because Paul elsewhere praises marriage. He's just saying, you just have to see this. But again, it's care because as, as Susan very nicely put it, you're, you're thinking about somebody else. Isn't that what you should be doing in a marriage? You should be thinking not just about yourself. You should be thinking about somebody else, this other person that you said, until death do us part. And you should be thinking that in a positive way, not like, man, that death's taken way too long. No, that's not the way you do it. You're looking at him and you're saying, you know what? I, I, I pledge to care for this person until... I can't care for them anymore because I'm gone or they're gone in that way. Um, but let's turn over to Matthew chapter six, Matthew chapter six. Matthew chapter six, again, uh, let's, let's put it, let's, I'm just going to say this. I should have said this at the outset. I think for most of us, this little study we're doing here, you all have been over this kind of stuff before. This is, we're not like, we're not like cutting new ground on here. But he says in Matthew 6, verse 31, Jesus is speaking to these Jews. And uh, verse 31, do not be anxious, uh, saying, what are we going to eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, sometimes you're going to worry about that. I mean, have any of you ever kind of been in a situation where you're like, this is kind of tight, this is hard, are we going to be able to feed the family, are going to be able to be adequately clothed come winter or come summer? And so a person might worry about that. And the thing is, is legitimately, sometimes is that something that sometimes is out of your control? Yeah, it might be out of your control. I always liked Gordon's saying he's made this a couple of times. He says, I can always find a job. Well, I think that probably is true most of the time, but sometimes you might be able to find a job, but it might not pay enough to be able to be able to eat adequately, <clears throat> drink adequately or clothe adequately, depending on your, on your circumstances. Verse 25, however, says, therefore I say to you, do not worry or be anxious. Do not worry <clears throat> about your life, what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or your body that what you should put on because the life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. He says, look at the birds of the heaven. They do not sow, they do not reap, neither do they gather uh, into storage places. Uh, but your father, uh, your heavenly father, he feeds them. And are you not worth more than them? Which by the way, uh, well, to be political, animal rights people might not like that, but Paul or but Jesus himself said, You're worth more than the animals. And yet God does care for the animals, but you're worth more. And then he says in verse 27, and who among you, being anxious or worrying, is able to even add one cubit 18 inches to his lifespan, to his to his height. He's not talking about adding. Well, he might be adding, can you add 18 inches to your height to make yourself 18 inches taller? But he probably really is literally talking about, can you add, can, can you live even 18 inches further <laughs> into the future? You can't. You can't do that by worrying about things. 
So these are examples here of worrying about things that you don't have control over. You have control over whether you can try to take care of your spouse. You have, there's something you can do when you're caring for the churches. Paul didn't just care for the churches. He acted on that when he had care for the churches. He did things. He wrote letters. He visited these people uh, in this way. Uh, the body of Christ, somebody has a need in the body of Christ, we saw in 1 Corinthians 12, you can actually care by doing something. So care, this word care of itself is not a bad word. It's bad by context when you are spending your time worrying about something that is outside of your control. It's outside of your control versus something, well, you can do something. There's a believer in front of you, they have a need. Can Maybe the need is big and I don't have the resources to meet that entire need. Can I meet some of that need? Yeah, maybe I can meet some of that need. Nobody says I have to meet the need in its entirety. That's some one of the foolish things sometimes we think, right? When it says that somebody has a need in the body, we can think, oh, that means I got to do all of it. I don't have to do all of it. Case in point, in our church, I don't have to teach everything. I only have to teach what God gives me in front of me. And there's other people that can shoulder and carry that teaching load. Jim doesn't have to teach everything. There's other people that can share and carry that teaching load. So it's this idea that there's something you can do, but you don't have to do everything. You can only do what God puts in front of you. Okay. So um, with that kind of, with the kind of that picture then about these cares, um, let's see Oh, we just already looked at that. And I looked at that under a, under in a different passage of scripture. So let's forget about that for the moment. So with that, then I want to go over to um, uh, first Peter uh, chapter five, then first Peter chapter five. Yeah. When Josh, when Josh, uh, texted me this this morning. I was like, hmm, God, what would you like? And, and this came to mind right away because I had a friend um, that's been texting back and forth with me for the last, I don't know, what would you say, Peg, three weeks. And that's kind of the way this person kind of can function a little bit. Yeah, that, that works well for this individual. And um, just going through some hard stuff, pastoring a church and pastoring a church where there's a lot of pushback against the teaching of the word. A lot of pushback from people, people that are like, the messages are too long, you know, and one of the people actually came to, came to this individual recently and said, hey, you know what, if, if that, fam that family left, if we leave, I know you're not going to be making enough money here at this church to survive. I mean, would you imagine if somebody actually told you this at the church, you know, and this, this, this kind of hurt this individual. And so anyway, this person's just been wondering should I leave? Maybe God wants me to go. Everything kind of, there's a lot of negatives going on here. Maybe I'm supposed to cut, you know? Um, and so all of that to say that there were a few things that we were talking back and forth with. And the thing is, is I've been there. I've been there. I know what that's like. Now, I don't think it's ever been quite as horrible as that in my experience, but I know what it's like to have some pushback and things like that. And so oh, I'm not even in first, I went to James 5. I'm looking down for my verse. <laughs> Long book. First, first Peter chapter 5, verse 1, he's addressing the elders. And then verse 5, he says, likewise, the younger men should submit to the elders. Now, I don't think when he says the younger men in verse 5, I don't think he's, I've told you this before, I don't think he's just talking about just younger guys in general ought to do what the elders in the church say. My this is my personal opinion from what he's saying based on the following statements. But I think he's talking about people that are gifted as pastor teachers and they, well, let's put it this way. If you're in a church and the pastor teachers, the elders aren't doing what they're supposed to do. And apparently these weren't, which is why Peter has to tell them at the first part, you need to start doing your job. You need to start shepherding. You need to start taking the oversight because apparently wasn't getting done. And he says, the younger guys, you need to submit to those elders. Apparently, some of them were like, well, the elders aren't getting it done, so we're going to do it. And it's really easy to do that, to just step up and push yourself to the front. But he says, 
and uh, and to one another, uh, and clothe yourself with humility. For God opposes the proud or the one that's got his face lifted up to the sky, but he but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, be humbled under God's mighty hand, that He might lift you up in the season, the proper time, or in the season. I believe what he's talking about is, you know what? You just learn to submit in the right time. God will raise you up. He'll put you in a position where you can have that position of leadership. But for the time being, for the time being, you submit yourself to these people. That brings us then to verse 7. And casting all your care or your anxiety or your worries, so same word, upon him, because he cares concerning you. Now, I don't know what this, what this care or anxiety is for sure. But I could see if you're maybe one of these guys, I felt like this. I've been in, gifted with the gift of pastor teacher and thinking I understand the word of God well. And you watch something going on in a church and you listen to the pastor and you're going. And you're just kind of like, this is, that, these people, there's people in this church that need help. And that's not giving him any help. That's a philosophical meandering up there that that guy just gave those people. And that's not going to, if I, if I were sitting in this service, I'd walk away going, I have no idea what that was about. I don't know what he was getting at. And so there's a part of me, Peggy knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> she was there with me. And there's, so there's a part of you that just kind of wants to just push through because you have a care for these people. You're concerned for these people, and you really want these people to have an understanding of who God is and what God's doing. But Peter says, don't push yourself out there. Don't do that. Don't put your face in the, in the sky and go, well, I know better. Just step aside and let me step in, and I'll fix it all. No, he says, you, you humble yourself under God's hand, and he will exalt you at the right time. And in that, you're going to cast your care. I think this is a positive care. I think this is something that to some degree that these guys really do care for these people. They have concern. I don't think that this is necessarily worry care. I think that this could, we could look at this in a general sense that he really, they really care for these people in this circumstance. And if you go through this letter, it's people that are going through, through, through suffering from the beginning of this book all to this point. It's Christians going through suffering and some of it authorized and ex executed at the hands of the government. And some of it coming from other sources. And Peter is telling them, throw your cares on him. Because those are things that are a concern to him for you. We're going to hit on this. Well, we're not going to go there. If you want to mark this down, the only other time that this word casting your Bibles may have casting or throwing, whatever it is. The only other time that word occurs is in Luke 19.35. And it has to do when Jesus, when they go get a colt for Jesus, and he's going to ride this, this, this donkey in on what they call the triumphal entry. And what did they do first? They took their, they took their, yeah, they took their cloaks, their garments, and they, what? No, they threw, them, they threw them on the donkey for him to sit on. Instead of having to ride bareback, a little hard on a donkey they gave him they put a bunch of blankets on top essentially their outer cloaks for jesus to sit on top of the this donkey and they threw them on top of the donkey and the donkey bore that weight of those cares so he says first of all you throw those over onto him because he and it literally because literally it says to him it is a care for you uh, we look at it like because he cares for you. But literally, it is a care. It's a different word here for care that he uses, but it's a care concerning you. In other words, he actually is interested in these things. He's interested in what we're going through on your behalf. And he will, he will address those things. You can't. In other words, these men. These men, they care for these people. They care about the situation. But you know what? They can't do anything about it. Essentially, their hands are tied because they're supposed to do what God wants. And what they're supposed to do as God wants 
is just to wait for God's timing. And that's a hard thing to come to realize in your Christian life. I had a professor in seminary that I, after my first year in seminary, anyway, I went through a bunch of crazy stuff that happened. That thing got straightened out. And then the next stupid, crazy thing that happened, well, well, if we're going to be this, you know what? I need to go find a church where I can get busy because the church where I'm going to, I'm not getting to do anything out there because there's already guys who graduated from seminary and they've already got two pastors and they don't need me out there. So we're going to go find a church where I can serve. So I can do something, you know, and you try to do that. And you know what? That never materialized. We tried and it was just really clear that was never going to be that. And in the process, Foolish Tim subjected his wife to having to sit for three months in a church with a pastor that sort of made some distinctions, but for the most part, guess what? Didn't really make distinctions. <laughs> and she just finally said, I need to go back where we're getting taught the word because we're not getting it here. And I knew that, but I'm just so stubborn trying to do, trying to take care of these things. And so sometimes we think we can care of these, but you know what? It wasn't God's season. It wasn't God's time. And I still remember this professor in seminary. He says, you know what? Sometimes God wants you to fold your hands, sit down and shut up. <laughs> he says, and we have a tough time with that because the world tells you, you crack your knuckles, stand up and get to work because God helps those who help themselves. And you know what? I've tried to help myself. And every time I've tried to solve problems that I think, and I think, oh, I can fix this problem in this way. It always ends up a nosedive for me. I've never experienced yet success in my trying to solve those problems. It's always interesting to, to learning to stop worrying about it, giving it to God. He says, casting them to him because it's a care to him about you. And others, he's the one that can do something about it. I can't. I think I can. I've got the illusion that I can do something about it, but I can't. Now, this is why it's important for you to do that. And this is what my friend was going through. And this is where I have been. You need to be sober and you need to watch for your adversary, the devil. He's going about like a roaring lion, seeking those he may devour. And you oppose him firm by the faith. Anyway. This, this is not just an, an addendum that he throws on here. This is part of why you need to get rid of those cares. Why, instead of shouldering them yourself, those things that you care about like this, you need to turn them over to him. Because when you have those cares, and this is the way I put it talking with my friend, and I've used this example for a long time. When you shoulder those cares and you are trying to, you're going to worry about it. You're going to try to fix it yourself. You're like, a gimpy gazelle on the Serengeti and the lion that's loping along the edge of there, looking around, going, well, I'm going to waste myself with Papa Gazelle over there. That guy moves way too fast, but gimpy over here is only doing 20. I'll take that guy on. In other words, Satan's smart. He's going to go after those people. Why not, why not just take, take these young guys down before they even have the chance to start really serving in the church in the way that they want to serve? Why not just get them? Take, take them down right now. Get them all frustrated. Give them up. Oh, I tried. Didn't work. That's it. I'm done with it. I'm done with God. Why? Because, well, they tried something. It didn't work out the way they thought it would. And they're just frustrated. And they're miserable. And every time that they think that they're going to get up and get their head straight, Satan comes along. <laughs> Don't you remember that time you tried? <laughs> Obviously, God doesn't want you doing that. Oh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> And you just kind of, he keeps you stuck there. So he says, you need to take those cares and you need to cast them. He can bear those. He can bear those cares in a way that you can't. I have, most of you know this, but I have, because I've. it's been a while since I've talked about this, but I went through a stretch with something that I was very concerned about, a person I was very concerned about, and I lost sleep. My wife was asleep because she can't sleep, but it's not because she lays in bed worrying all night. I, was, I don't normally lose sleep, but I was losing sleep because I would wake up and I could not shut down my mind. All I could think was problem after problem, scenario after scenario, worrying about 
this person. And I needed, and it took a long time for me to do what I knew the word of God says. And, just, and, you, and you know, this is the hardest part about it when you take it to God. Because when you take it to God for a long time, when I talk to God, I'm like, God, this person has this need and they need this and this and this. So if you show them this, this, and this, and you know what? It, eventually you just have to be able to get to the point and say, God, they need help. Whatever you need to do in their life, you need to do that. And I need to be okay with that. I don't dictate to God how he's going to fix somebody or how he's going to help in a need or deal, deal with these things. And when I finally got to that point, quit worrying about that. Man, I found I go back to sleep, actually. But this is after, my wife will tell, tell you, this is after months of having several nights a week that I couldn't sleep because I was so worried. I don't know if any of you have ever been there in that situation before. It might have been a different type of situation, but that was, that was the one I, that I went through. Now, I think all of us know this. Where would you go as a passage that complements this about how do you throw them onto him? How do you do that? There's a passage that complements this. Philippians chapter 4. Turn over to Philippians chapter 4. Again, like I said, we've been over that passage in First Peter. We've been over this. But Philippians chapter 4. And interestingly enough, if you go through this, this is about a conflict, a conflict that apparently involved two ladies in the church. I think I'm very glad that he left it open and didn't tell us exactly the full nature of the conflict. Because if he did, then we would go, well, we don't have that conflict. We've got some conflict in here, but it's not that one. So this has nothing to do with us. And we'd miss out on the fact that, you know what? When you have two believers that don't want to work together, and in general, exactly why, I don't know. But in general, somebody's feelings or their soul got hurt. And so because their soul got hurt, they're like, I'm not working with that person anymore because they, this is the way they handled this. And in the midst of this, then he says, in verse, let's just go to verse six. He says, do not worry about one thing or not one thing worry. So in a, again, in this context, when he's talking about worrying, this is kind of like the worrying that Jesus warned about a little bit over in Matthew six. You can't do anything about this. You know why you can't do anything about it? Well, I didn't finish up what I was saying about why those young men were supposed to cast those in. They can't do anything about it because they don't set the time clock. They don't say, hey, I have put in my year. It's now time to let me do my thing. They don't do that. That's God's timing. Likewise here, Paul actually says, if you go back up to verse 2, I encourage Yodi and encourage Syntyche to have the same reflective mind of the Lord. Yes, and you true yoke fellow, he says, you, I'm just trying to find my word in here, you help, there, you help those who have worked together like a team in the gospel with me and with Clement and with the rest of the co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Help them. So he says, you still help them. But you know what? This is the tough thing about trying to help a believer. You can't make them receive the help. And you can't, even if you, even if you give them, Jim, if you give them a detailed instruction on how to deal with a spiritual problem, does that mean they automatically just do it? <laughs> Don't you wish? <laughs> yeah, we all know that, right? We all know that that you can talk to people about their attitude, you can talk to people about what they're doing, but you can't make them do it. Does that mean you're going, well, guess I can't help them, so I'm not gonna do anything? No, he said he told them. We already know before he get to this, he told them to help, but he said, in helping, don't let it become one of those cares that you just carry around all the time and it weighs down on you because you can't fix that all you can do is try to help them so he says in verse uh, verse six though, so care for nothing but in everything by worship and supplication after thanksgiving let your request be made known to god 
So walk, let's walk through all these very quickly. The first thing, worship. What's worship? Our word Bible has prayer. What do you do when you worship? You're, you're, you're basically telling God who he is because God's sitting up there in heaven going, ah, who am I? You, you, you ever heard, um, oh, what's his Uncle Milty, Milton Burrow, you ever heard that when he, at that time he would go around, he was going around to nursing homes and he was kind of doing some of his Milton Burrow shtick with them. And one day he walked up and he was shaking hands afterwards. And there was this lady that just going, oh, nice to meet you. And he goes, and she just kind of the way she was acting, he goes, do you know who I am? She goes, don't you, don't you, don't you know who I am? I yeah. And she goes, oh, just go over to the desk. They'll tell you your name. <laughs> <laughs> Well, see, obviously that lady was used to being in a place where people didn't always remember who they were. But God, God, does God know who he is every moment of every, what we'd say every moment of every, Yeah, God doesn't need to be reminded. Who does need to remember who God is? We do. We need to remember who God is. There's so many things. Do we need to remember that God is really good? I still, I, I shared that story with you a couple of years ago when Katie had Isaac. Katie had just gotten she actually she was just she still technically had covid but she'd gotten over the worst of it but she'd been down with covid for like five days she could barely get up and like walk from laying on the futon to walk like to that door in the corner to use the bathroom that's how far it was across that room less shorter than that shorter than that yeah she could barely make that and then you know what Thanksgiving night, when she's just starting to feel less puny and like she actually can get up and move around, she goes into labor with this little boy. And then she had to be in the hospital, but because of that, she ended up having bleeding and blood problems with it. And you know what that does for Tim? That pushes the panic button and sends me into high drive worry. And I'm like, ah, ah, ah. not outwardly, but. But you know what I did? This God brought me to this passage, reminded me of this. And I sat out on the futon. And I started walking through stories of the Bible. This is the way I saw. I don't always worship God like this, but sometimes God, you're the God that created. You created with a word. That's how powerful you are. That you could create all of this with a word. Are you powerful enough to take care of my daughter? <laughs> yeah, sure you are. And you flooded the entire world because you're righteous, not just because you're powerful. Are you righteous enough to handle my daughter in a righteous man? Yeah, you are. And so, and I just walked through, I don't know, I probably walked through about eight Old Testament stories, not because I'm applying the Old Testament, but because I'm reminding myself from those, that's the kind of God you are. And do you still exercise power in her life? Yeah, like you did when you created, it's still that same power. And it's still the same righteousness and it's still the same goodness and so on and so forth. See, that's a practical exercise, practical use of Old Testament doctrine that you're not really practicing. You're using it to remind yourself of the character of our God. And she has more value than many sparrows. <laughs> and she has there. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's, a, that's a good one to add there. So he says, in everything by worship, it, it, it you're going to, you really need to remember who God is. And then he says, and then supplication. And the interesting thing about the word supplication here, this word deasis, is a word meaning you're not telling God how to do it. You're just crying out for help. And you will take whatever God says. I had a friend that told me, this is years ago, this is like 30 years ago. He says, I prayed and prayed and prayed for my son. He says, and God finally brought me to the point. He says, because I wasn't seeing any of that, anything happening. That he says, God had to bring him to the point where he's able to say, God, you need to do with my son whatever it takes. I'm not asking for a specific. I'm just saying whatever it takes. And he says, and he realized, he said, when he was saying that, he said, that means if you have to take my son home, you take my son home. That's oh, you mean, you know, that's deasis. You're not telling God how to do it. You are throwing your hands up and you're saying, God, you need to do whatever you need to do. 
And then he goes on and he says, all that is done technically after Thanksgiving. The first thing you do is you remember God's, you remember God's good grace to you. God is abundantly gracious to us. And then he says, and let your request, now these things are more specific, let your request be made known to God. You're going to have some specific things that you're going to ask for. You're saying, God, we need help in this church. We have people that are fighting and we need to get along. And I don't know how this is going to happen, but we need to learn to work together as a team again. Instead of everybody kind of being their own free agent. And he says, and when you do that, the peace of God, that literally, that word surpasses our understanding, literally, it covers over the noose. It comes over to shield our, our, our noose as we're thinking. And this is being bombarded by all of this nonsense, all of these problems that are going on here, all these things that are causing me to worry. And he says, it covers over, covering over the mind. It guards your heart. What do you do with your heart? You make choices and decisions. It's going to guard your heart and it's going to guard this is, again, this is not your thought. Noema ta. Noema is not your thinking. Noema is not your thought. It's the conclusions. It's, it's when it gets messed up by this stuff. And, you, you know, the little ticker tape goes, ch -ch 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 bing. oh, there's the answer. You know, we don't do that anymore. You Google and bing, it gives you the answer. It gives you a million answers that you don't want. And hopefully in there, you can find the one you were looking for, you know, but that's, the noemata, it's the results of the thinking. And he says, it's able to guard your hearts and it's able to guard the conclusions of your mind. Because the conclusions of your mind can really be tainted by, the, by these cares and worries and concerns. And you can draw conclusions that God doesn't want you to draw. And then you run off half cock to try to fix this thing, thinking, I can get this done. And you're just going to make the thing worse. But he can do it in Christ. Jesus. There are cares. There are things we're supposed to care about. We're supposed to care about people. You're married. You're supposed to care about your spouse. Those are things you legitimately care about, and there's things you attend to and do. But there are cares that you have that we might think are somewhat legitimate, but they're cares over which we have no control. You can't control what a church is going to do. You can't control the timing of whether or not you're going to be put into a position in ministry like those, those guys over there. You can't control whether these two ladies and other people may be affected by them are going to start getting along and working right. But you can take those cares that you can't control, that you cannot really do anything about other than respond well, and you can throw those over onto Jesus, like throwing those blankets on the back of that mule. And you can throw them onto him. He will care about them for you. And he will give you peace that'll settle this. And he will give you the ability to make good decisions by guarding your heart and draw good conclusions through the thinking of your mind. Nothing wrong with having cares. Just need to have the right attitude about those cares and determine, determine whether those cares are things that God have, wants us to do something about or cares that he wants us to just let him let go of. So I shared that again. This just, I shared this and then my friend, uh, when we went over this, there was other things we talked about the other day, but uh, man, I've been through this and I'll go through it again. Here I was, here I was sharing this stuff with him. And it really helped him let go of stuff. And he actually told me he slept really well. But you know what? Even though I've shared that with him, uh, I, I probably will go down this path again. Maybe this week, maybe in another month, maybe, maybe it won't be next year. I don't know. It's just, it, I would like to say I'm not going to, but knowing me, knowing the fact that we're still not glorified, I'll probably unnecessarily carry some burdens and cares. And, uh, but this is how you handle it. And God will, I trust, well, I, I know he will. He'll remind me of this, whether I follow his lead, that's always another matter. But he remind me to come to him and let him take care of those things. Any questions, thoughts? Okay.
Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the fact that you give us a means of unburdening ourselves of those things that you don't mean for us to carry, those things that uh, we don't need to worry about because only you can take care of them. And we're thankful for your word that actually tells us how to throw those burdens over to you. And uh, we're thankful then for the God that you are, that you are so good and kind to us that you would tell us how to handle this situation properly. And we thank you for it. Amen. I thought that was going to be 30 minutes. I'm sorry, it was 40. Hope, hope you're not all disappointed for me 